circumvent the circumcision. In today's episode, I'm speaking with Brendan Marotta, who is the director of the 2017 film American Circumcision. This is a difficult topic for many people to talk about because in acknowledging the truth behind why circumcision happens and the lies people have been told, then we're faced with the horror of realizing that people have been duped. There is no good reason to cut off a baby's penis, only terrible ones. And then once you realize this, how do you pick up the pieces? How do you heal? The truth is that male circumcision came about for the exact same reasons why people scream bloody murder and that's genital mutilation when it's done to women. The reason is to prevent sexual pleasure. Oh, but isn't this for religious reasons, Kim? But it's it's for hygiene, right? Um, really? You think that God or nature messed up the most important part of human's anatomy, the part re responsible for the reproduction of the species, and oops, made a mistake there? No. Dig deeper. Within every single culture, religion, or explanation around circumcision, you go back further, and it's always about trying to prevent sexual pleasure, knowing that this part of the male anatomy is incredibly sensitive, and if we remove it, we will perhaps remove also their desire for excessive lust and sex. But what it really does is cut off, obviously, a very pleasurable part of a person's anatomy and the essence of who they are. So, you know, in the midst of all of these stories and rationalizations and beliefs that people have, we see people fighting for the right to circumcise. This is called internalized oppression. When people can't bear to look at the truth, they settle for a lie or a story that makes themselves feel better about something that's utterly horrific. It's a form of Stockholm Syndrome, this idea you're being kept prisoner and you fall in love with your keeper as a way of making the experience not feel so bad. I believe that the reason we have a premature ejaculation epidemic where 75% of men come within three minutes of intercourse is that men are fully dissociated from their sexual organs. And how could you not be when one of the biggest and most formative experiences of your life, perhaps even on the first day of your life, is having your genitals cut off? In the interview with Brendan, we'll discuss how the foreskin is not some inconsequential part of the male anatomy. It actually has miles and miles of nerve endings. How through the ages, circumcision has been used as a cure-all for all kinds of random things like diarrhea. And we'll address the common myths that people have about why it's useful, like this idea of hygiene or the concept that babies don't feel pain. And what is foreskin restoration? and is it really effective? The answer is yes. And how the foreskin itself in an intact man is multi-orgasmic, capable of having all kinds of different orgasms, just like the way women can have G-spot orgasms and cervical orgasms in their vaginas. So here is Brendan. Brendan, thankfully, was inspired to bring all of his information and research to the public. This documentary has been years in the making. It's an award-winning feature-length documentary about the modern circumcision debate and the growing intactivist movement, which is an incredible word, this idea of intact and activist put together, and this overall concept that human beings ought to be able to make their own choices about their own bodies. Brendan, welcome. It's so wonderful to have you here. Thanks for having me on. So when I have done any kind of research into circumcision, there's all of these justifications like hygiene or religion. But if you dig deeper, the origin is always about preventing sexual pleasure. Like, am I wrong in my research? Because that's what I've seen. And then it just gets thinly veiled with these other justifications. But the root always seems to be, even in religious circumstances, that it's come from a way of preventing lustful sexual expression. Let's cut off a piece of a man's penis. Yeah, and when you're dealing with any kind of shame or shadow, there's often a lot of what we call cover emotions or cover justifications in this case. So, you know, if you talk to most parents in America about 
circumcision, they will, at least the ones who have done it, will say, oh, it's cleaner, it'll give some medical justification. But if you look at the history, circumcision began as a medical practice in the United States to prevent masturbation. So during the Victorian era, a lot of the attitudes you're describing were present. They saw sexuality as somehow harmful and damaging to one's health and needing to be prevented. And, you know, masturbation was seen as the cause of a great many both social and physical ills. So, they, you know, all those jokes that you hear people make about, oh, if you, you know, masturbate too much, you'll go blind or you're, you'll get hair on your palms or something like that. Things that we joke about as absurdities now, they actually believed in the Victorian era. And so they thought that by removing the most pleasurable part of a man's penis, you could prevent this awful thing. And over time, those justifications went away because we had in America the sexual revolution. So preventing sexual pleasure was no longer seen as a good thing. And at that point, all the marketing around circumcision changed. And it went to, oh, it's cleaner, it's better. There's no difference in sexuality. When you look at the history of circumcision, it's exactly the opposite. They knew that it would dramatically reduce the amount of pleasure a man could feel. And that was the intention of it, because they saw that pleasure as somehow harmful or bad. And when you go back in the religious history, especially in Judaism, it's similar. So there was a uh, famous rabbi, Moses Maimonides, who at one point said that the purpose of circumcision was to reduce sexuality, that the man would lose interest in that and he could focus more on God. So the cultures that this comes from also are, are very sex negative. Um, when you look at the ancient Roman and Greek cultures, they saw the foreskin as the center of male pleasure. And mm. if you look at art from those cultures, the, the foreskin is very large. That's right. It's the thing that yeah, all of the giant. attention is going on. Yeah. Now, now compare that to their neighbors, the, the Israelites and Jewish people. Uh, if you wanted to attack someone else's God, if you will, like, what would you do? Well, if all their focus is on that sort of male virility, you'd cut that off. Uh, it's, it's almost like they're attacking a, a false idol in their view of like, oh, this is not what we want to focus on. And it's a differentiation there. Um, and if you go really far back in the history, you know, pre, because many people think that circumcision began in the biblical and Jewish tradition, but it actually goes back further. You know, that was a, a custom that was there in the ancient world prior to the biblical text. And they said, well, we're going to take this custom that already exists and make it a, a symbol of our covenant. If you go back further to, to the earliest African writings about circumcision, first of all, it's both male and female circumcision that they existed together in traditional African cultures. And when you go back to the symbolism of it, what they believed was that in the, the foreskin was the feminine of the man, and in the clitoris was the, the masculine of the woman. So, and that to create gender, you had to remove the opposite gender from the other. So the, the foreskin is wet, it's enveloping, it's receiving, all of things that you would associate with the feminine body. And the clitoris, it gets erect, it is a, a nub, it is, uh, sticks out from the body, and they see this as more masculine. And so they thought to create gender, you had to remove one from the other. And now we have a very different view of gender. And I think part of the reason that Western cultures see female circumcision as really bad, and male circumcision as tolerable, is that women have fought very hard for the right to play the masculine role. So the idea, one of the worst things you could say to a woman is that it's not okay for her to play a traditionally masculine role and that she has to play a traditionally female role. So like mm -hmm. if you were to say the phrase, you know, get back in the kitchen, that would be extremely <laughs> offensive. But the opposite, the opposite's not true. So if you tell a man, get back to work, that's not as offensive, right? In fact, right. we see men who exhibit feminine qualities as weak or worthless, and there's a lot of shaming language around men that have that. So to cut off what symbolically might symbolize the, the masculine element in women, it seems one of the worst things you can do, but the same is not true of men. 
So there's a bit of uh, gender equality work that hasn't been done there. But you're right that in all of these cultures, there is a view that some aspect of sexuality or gender is not okay and shameful and needs to be removed. And, and it, it's slightly different. There's a nuance to each culture, but that theme runs throughout it. And the practice of circumcision involves removing as much sensitive nerve ending tissue as you can without losing the ability to procreate. So there are some forms of female circumcision that can remove more tissue because a lot of the woman's body is internal. Right. Uh, but male circumcision does remove all the tissue that they could while still allowing for procreation. So it's a very much an attack on, on pleasure more than procreation because in a lot of the cultures that you know practice circumcision i mean obviously if you, you can't remove procreation or else your culture dies out right but pleasure is you know something different seen as optional so there's right yeah as as if as if the two are separable it's so interesting what you're saying about the deeper symbolism, the origins of this, of like the masculine part of the woman and the feminine part of the man. That's a very profound insight that I haven't heard anyone articulate before. And it's, yeah, it seems like it really rings true in, in a very deep way. So that comes from uh, a woman named Fwambai, who we interview in the film, who is a woman from Sierra Leone who chose to get circumcised as an adult. So her traditional culture in Sierra Leone, it's part of their initiation ritual. And she went there and, and as an adult had that done. Um, and I, I think a lot of people are really shocked by her, her testimony and her speaking because the view in Western culture is that female circumcision is always awful and always done to oppress women's sexuality. And then it's, on the other hand, that you know, male circumcision is somehow good and for the benefit of the man. And when you talk to women who come from cultures where that's been done, they say many of the same things that circumcised men say. They say, well, it's cleaner, it's healthier, my sex life is better after having done this. Uh, <laughs> and so the psychology is similar. And I know that there are people who would say, uh, that those women, you know, they're just brainwashed or they have the the bias of the fact that they've had this done to them. They don't want to admit something wrong happened to them. But all of those same arguments could be made of male circumcision. And in Absolutely. fact, when you hear the two yeah. cultures speak, it's very similar. Because the, the, the structure of cognitive bias is similar regardless of culture. Yeah, well, it's, it's very interesting because to me, it's like a form of internalized oppression or even Stockholm syndrome that you have to start to rationalize this offense, this violation that was done. And it's interesting to see people fight for that right. And there's been such a, you know, even in like definitely in American culture, there's almost a vilification of, a, of an uncircumcised man. Like, oh, that's gross, or oh, there's like, you know, teasing and these words that go along with it, which is so bizarre to see how deeply entrenched then those beliefs have become with people or, you know, those programmed beliefs. Well, even the language, uncircumcised. Right. That implies that circumcision is the norm. Exactly. You wouldn't, you wouldn't call a <laughs> woman who was whole unmasectomied right. or un clitoridectomized. You'd say she's whole, she's natural, she's intact. Yeah. So one of the things that the, the movement against circumcision, which is known as intactivism, a combination of the word intact and activist. A great name. One of the things that they, they want to shift is even that language. So like referring to men as intact or whole or yeah. natural. Because even that language implies that somehow a man who was born, you know, with all of his body parts and didn't have anything happen to him, you know, born naturally, that there's somehow something unnatural about him, which is not the case. So what, before we get a little further into your documentary, what inspired you to create it in the first place? So I sometimes hesitate to answer this question because... On the one hand, the answer is very obvious. Like, this happened to me, right? Like, I have a scar on my body, and I wanted to understand why that was there. Um, and it's odd to me that more people in our culture aren't curious about it. Yeah. And I think that there's a lot of what we call cultural trance there, that you're just sort of under the spell yeah. of a particular way of seeing the world. You know, up until about age eight, most children will accept whatever you tell them. 
and you know, if someone, an adult says something, you just go, okay, and kind of goes in. Um, I, I studied hypnosis at one point, and one of the things that my hypnosis teacher told me is that when he was a kid, you know, he was filling out those little Scantron tests, and the teacher told him, like, you have to make sure the little hand, you know, you have to fill it in thickly so the little hand can read, the, on the machine can read it. And then as an adult, he was working in the public school system making those tests, and he went to the machine, and he opened it up, and he thought, there's no little hand here. But of course, his mind immediately went, well, of course there's not. But like when he was a kid, someone told him that, and it just sort of went in, and he never questioned it, and that was the image in his mind. And I think for a lot of people, their ideas about sexuality are similar. They're, they're told something as a kid, and they just sort of believe it and go, oh, okay. Uh, and over time, those false assumptions get corrected either through personal experience or someone tells you something different. Like but our culture Claus. is not very – yeah, Exactly. But our, but our culture doesn't really know a lot about the foreskin. People aren't educated about it. And unless if, if, if it's something that happened to you and you're a straight man or you're with partners who are circumcised, you're not going to have that experience to see something different. So, you know, I also say, you know, if this happened to you yesterday instead of when you were a baby, you'd question it a lot more. Like if you just woke mm -hmm. up one day and, you know, half the shaft skin of your penis was missing, like how long would you spend trying to figure out what happened there, and right? And you've been strapped uh, down and held down against your will. And... Right. So, so you have to have a point where that trance is broken. And for me, uh, that was during a meditation group in Los Angeles. So I, I have a practice of Zen meditation where I just sort of sit and am present with whatever comes up. And I had sort of stumbled across the topic of circumcision before and always sort of thought, well, that's something I can do about that now. So, mm -hmm. you know, out of right. sight, out of mind, right. I won't think about it. Uh, it's kind of uncomfortable to think about. And yet during this meditation, I, I felt this sort of cold sensation in the body and I felt all my energy drain down to my belt. And it was this really uncomfortable, uh, like cold presence. And I just had the word circumcision enter my mind more than once during this meditation. And so I thought, okay, some part of my consciousness wants me to look at this and I pay attention to what comes up in meditation. So I went home and I started researching. And one of the first things I found was something called foreskin restoration. So there are complex nerve endings in the foreskin that you can't get back if you've had them removed. But what men will do is they'll take the remaining skin and stretch it over time, just gentle, constant pressure until they have a covering of that part of the body again. And one of the things I learned while working on my documentary is that there's nearly, and this is our best estimate because obviously, you know, there are a lot of men who do this and do not uh, share that they're doing it with anyone. But the best estimate I've heard is about a quarter of a million men around the world doing this. Wow, so I thought great. that's interesting. You know, my 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 whole life I've been told there's nothing I can do about it, and apparently right. there's something I can do about it. So what else have I not been told? And that sort of opened the 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 gates to learn everything that I could possibly learn about this subject. So let's dive into what are men missing if they have the procedure done? Because I think there's this, again, justification, rationalization, like, oh, it's no big deal. There's just a little snip or a cut and whatever, no big deal. You know, I still have sex, Norm, you know, like I still have pleasure during sex. What are men missing that they don't know they're missing? So first of all, there's no standard what men are missing. It actually varies person to person. It's not like men are born with a dotted line on their body that says cut here, right? So there's In America, they differences, are. <laughs> right? Well, that's the, the cultural perception. But the one the, the part that is removed in every circumcision uh, is the foreskin and the frenular band, the, uh, or the excuse me, the ridged band, the, the opening that encircles the foreskin. And this is the most nerve dense part of a man's body. So the same way that women can get orgasms and different sensations from different parts of their body, men actually can too. And so the sensations that come from those nerve endings might feel slightly different than the ones that would come from the head of the penis and the ones that would come from the frenulum, which is the underside 
of the foreskin. If you have ever looked at your penis, there's sort of, or a penis, I suppose, uh, there's sort of a, a place that comes up on the underside. And that's actually what's known as a, fr a frenulum. It's something that holds the foreskin in place and connects it. You, you have a frenulum in your lip that keeps your lip from falling down in front of you and right. connects the underside of your lip. So there's something similar. And and there's a lot of nerve endings around the opening, that, that ridge band, which makes sense. You have a lot of nerve endings around all of the openings of the body. So, for example, your lips, um, a uh, woman's vagina and and the anus and all of those places because the it's important for you to know if something's entering your body or not right and the same is true of these nerve endings around the edge of the foreskin uh, and the inside of the foreskin the foreskin itself has two layers so there is the outer layer and then the inner layer and the inner layer is full of sensitive tissue and if you have been circumcised you can feel the difference between those layers by running your finger along the area above the scar line and the area below the scar line. And I would bet that the area above the scar line is significantly more sensitive. So if you can, you can actually, if you're, if you're circumcised, feel the difference between what that foreskin lining would feel like and what the area outside feels like. And on circumcised men, the most sensitive part is often the scar tissue because scar tissue tends to feel a bit more, but it's more sensitive to pain. So if something has experienced right. scarring, right. the body wants to know, okay, if I'm going to feel pain here again, I need to be aware of that. And so it's actually a little hypersensitive to pain. And, and you don't want that part of the body to be hypersensitive to pain. I think most people would prefer that it's sensitive to pleasure or good <laughs> sensations. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the nerve endings that are in the foreskin and the ridge band are what's known as Meisner's corpuscles. And you have a Meisner's corpuscles in the palms of your hand. That's one of the most common places to feel the difference. And the interesting thing about those types of nerve endings is that the lighter your touch, the more that you feel. So if you just sort of palm your hands together, you might feel some sensation. But if you really slowly run a finger across the palms of your hand or a feather or something like that, you'll feel it a lot more. And you can feel that the back of your hand doesn't have the same sensation. So if you run your fingertips along the back of your hand, you do feel something, but it's not as much as the palm of your hand. So similarly, there's a lot of nuanced sensations that the inner lining of the foreskin and the ridge band are capable of. And when you talk to men about their sexuality, they often will say, well, I mean, it's fine. I can get off. But they're not aware of the different types of sensations they're getting they're not aware of the quality of those sensations. So you might feel good, you know, if someone uh, touches the palm of your hand, but there's a difference between that and the nuanced sensations you would get for, from different types of touch. And there's a difference between the orgasm that comes from the head of the penis and the one that comes from the frenulum and the ridged band. And depend, you know, this is another place where it differs person to person some people have a lot of their frenulum still, and some do not. And so, depending on how much you have, you might be able to feel that place. And I would also bet that on men who still have their frenulum, it's the most sensitive part for them. So, the, the circumcision scar is often, for many men, the most sensitive part. But if you have your frenulum, you still have a piece of the foreskin. And that may be something that you could orgasm from or experience at least experience a lot of, of pleasure from alone so when people do the foreskin restoration so how is that increasing or is it increasing pleasure like i'm assuming that parts of the penis the head the frenulum area that are normally covered by the foreskin are more sensitive and perhaps without the foreskin then they become more exposed and like desensitized over time so is rebuilding the foreskin increasing restoring that sensitivity like how is that bringing back more pleasure for the man you've got the basic right idea so the foreskin during sex glides over the head of the penis when a man is circumcised, he's relying only on the friction of his body against his partner's body. And when he's intact, his foreskin will actually glide in and out uh, over top the head of the penis. Um, and that actually changes the, the quality and the rhythm of sex. So if you 
have twice the skin rubbing over itself, you don't need as much friction. If you are relying solely on friction to feel pleasure, you might have to do longer strokes or faster strokes. Mm -hmm. And that changes the experience for the woman as well. Because if you have to do longer strokes, you pull your body away from the woman more than, than you would have to if you were able to do shorter strokes and stay closer. Uh, that I've heard it said too that those shorter strokes often mean that your body is rubbing against hers more and also rubbing against the outside of her body, so her clitoris and things like that. So it changes sex for both partners. And if you restore the foreskin, then you have that gliding motion again and sex is closer to what it would be if you were natural or intact. But the other thing that it does is that it keeps the head of the penis more wet and sensitive. So if you rub a body part a lot, like say along the inside of your pants, or even, you know, one of the most common places this happens is your elbows. You, you get what's known as keratinization. So the body feels something rubbing something a lot and starts to build up tough tissue there. It's similar to how, you know, you have a lot of nerve endings in your hands, but if you work with your hands a lot, you get calluses on your hands because the body wants to keep that area safe. Similarly, if you look at circumcised men, the head of the penis is often keratinized. It looks dry and sort of cracked skin. And if you look at intact men, it's much smoother. And so when you restore the foreskin, when you have a covering there again, you have that area become moist and softer again. M men actually also produce their own natural lubrication, and it's exactly the same as the lubrication that women's bodies produce. So in America, you often, a lot, you know, America, actually it's America and Israel are the largest markets for personal lubricants. Now, why is that? It for doesn't make sense that in nature you would need to... For female for, lubricants? For, for, for lubricants for sex. Um, so things like, you know, astrogliders, things like so that. So just in general sales, um, not specifically for females. Yes. So okay. general, not, not female specific. Um, but you look at that, you know, it doesn't make sense that you would need something like that in, you know, in nature, you, you, sh right. you shouldn't have to like go to the CVS before you yes. have sex with someone. Um, the body naturally produces its own lubrication, but when that's removed, then the man is not producing his. And actually, when people shame intact men's bodies, one of the things they'll say, they'll talk about is smegma or that there's like something in there. But right. that's actually the same lubrication that's in a woman's body. So when you talk about a woman being wet, it is exactly the same as the thing that we shame in men. And that lubrication comes back if you cover the head of the penis and it's not drying out anymore. And by the way, if you're circumcised, you could test this. So if you were to just wear a condom for two to three weeks straight, this would also occur because that part of the body would be covered and it wouldn't be rubbing against everything. And some of that sensation would come back. Uh, I actually know one guy who he was... Thought, thought this whole anti-circumcision thing was kind of silly and wanted to debunk it and tried that and uh, then became an intactivist and started <laughs> a chapter of the organization. So, you know, these, the interesting thing about all of these sexual claims is that even if you're circumcised, you can test them on yourself if you're willing to explore. But I think that people are sometimes afraid to explore because of what it would mean if that were true which gets yeah. into the whole psychological element and the fact that, um, you know, people are very afraid not just to face sexuality, but also trauma and, and things they might have experienced. Absolutely. I mean, the stats that I've seen are that women enjoy sex and orgasm more frequently and have more lubricated naturally sex with intact men. Yes. Yeah. So, Walk me through a couple of the common myths out there. Like we talked about the origins, like dispelling the idea that it's somehow this religious based thing, which whatever becomes a cover for the true source of it. But what about the hygiene argument and the idea that babies don't feel pain? Can you talk about those? 
Sure. So the hygiene thing actually goes back to the Victorian history I mentioned earlier. And when they would talk about that, they were not talking just talking about physically hygienic, but morally hygienic, that there's oh. something somehow unclean about sexuality that needs to be removed. Uh, and that claim got repeated later and really popularized, uh, I think it was either the 40s or the 50s. I don't remember the doctor's name who did it. But he was also very specifically referring often to... Was it Dr. Kellogg? Um, was it Dr. Kellogg? No, so, so Kellogg was a Victorian <laughs> uh, oh, he was early. who was very pro-circumcision. Yeah, but there was someone in the uh, 40s and 50s, I believe, who was specifically promoting it because he saw uh, black sexuality as somehow predatory and was specifically promoting it to that community to make them, really? you know, quote unquote, cleaner. Yeah, there's a lot. When you get into the wow. history of this, there's a lot of weird claims it's that have been made. I mean, at one point it was fuck. supposed to cure <laughs> epilepsy. Um, you know, there's all sorts of like weird. I saw about diarrhea. Like if you had recurrent diarrhea, if you got a circumcision, that would help. Yeah, the the joke I've heard is that it's a cure in search of a disease. So we we know we're doing this. Right. So there must be a reason why we're doing it. So we got to find something that we can use the justification, and and that's the challenge of of anything that has the structure of trauma to it, is that well, if you acknowledge that something was a trauma or was wrong, then you also have to acknowledge the people who didn't protect you when you were young mm. and that they might have done something wrong. And I don't want to acknowledge, you know, that my parents might have done something bad to me. So I will pretend that my parents were perfect and in my culture was perfect. And in fact, because I want to be perfect too, I'll reenact the same trauma on my own children, right? Yeah. Uh, and so a lot of these excuses follow that structure. And I can get really deep into the science of some of them, you know, the first sequence around uh, one of those claims was just an hour on one of them in, in my film. And the difficulty is that they don't really address the underlying questions. So if you believe that human beings have the right to their own body, you know, my body, my choice, um, consent matters, all of those things, then the health claims don't really address that. So if there's a procedure, I mean, for example, um, I saw a story recently about a woman who got a uh, prophylactic mastectomy. So she was afraid she was going to get breast cancer and had her breasts removed. And you could debate whether or not you think that's a good idea. But I don't think anyone would seriously argue that you should then do that to children so that they don't ha they have the same health benefits, right? We all acknowledge that. I wouldn't no, be surprised if we get there. Honestly, no. the way things are going these days, in the next few decades, that wouldn't surprise me. Okay, maybe yeah, right I, now we're considering a, it a bit absurd, but I, I think that day is on its way. I I, sh I shudder at the level of consciousness that would think that's a good well, idea. We shudder at the level of consciousness that's doing this, you know? Like that True. this has become so normalized, right? That it's like no big deal. Right. And it's, it's the power of culture in part and trauma to self perpetuate itself. And it's one of the reasons why it's really important to create cultural change. So there are people who will enact things like this out of their trauma or out of a ability to profit monetarily from it. And there has to be, you know, working against that is the same amount of work. Um, and often, often with less resources. So, uh, I, yeah, I, I I can see where you're going with that, and I think that you know it's one of the reasons it's important to talk about it. You had another health claim you wanted me to address, but I forgot what it was. Well, the hygiene one, like I'm not sure if you fully answered that, but if somebody was you know making that as their argument, because when I brought it up to people, that's usually the first one that they cite is health and hygiene, and then the second question was this idea that not that there's any good reason to do it, but part of how people rationalize is this concept that babies don't feel pain. So if you could, if there's oh, anything yeah. else you could say to hygiene and then go on to the babies don't feel pain idea. So on hygiene, I guess the question to ask is, do you think that the human body is dirty? 
do you think there's inherently something gross or unhygienic about sexuality? Do you think that children are born in need of fixing? And part of the challenge of those excuses is that they're a, a one-liner that's designed to end thought. And when you start actually seriously considering the idea that somehow the natural male body is mm -hmm. unhygienic and in need of fixing, it becomes absurd. And it reveals a way of thinking that is almost anti-human. Part of the problem, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, to me, that's so obvious is like we're saying that nature or God or however people believe that we've come to be here was wrong, made a big mistake. Oops, but made it, got it wrong are, on every, uh, every man. <laughs> got to fix right. it on but the area that's responsible for they're... reproduction, like the most important right. area of the species. Oops, fucked that one up. Right. The, the most, the place, the most evolutionary design has gone right. into. Right. Right. But people are told those things when they're young and never question them and often never look at them in light of the other values they have. So I suspect most of your audience mm. is very sex positive. They think that sexuality is healthy and natural. And yet this is a piece that many people haven't integrated into their larger beliefs. And, you know, I, I, I suspect that most of the people in America think that consent is important and that people have the right to whatever type of sexuality they're they're interested in as long as it isn't harming anyone else and you know i think most people would hate the idea of conversion therapy or something like that attempts to change someone's sexuality but this is a surgical conversion therapy this is really yeah. literally cutting away part of someone's sexuality and and getting into the second question you had about the claim that babies don't feel pain this is a huge excuse that was perpetuated in the medical community for many years and we can say now has been completely scientifically disproven. So all of the research that we have indicates that not only do babies feel pain, but they feel it much more deeper and more profoundly and with a more lasting effect than adults do. So pain caused in early childhood has an effect on later behavior. And this has been scientifically proven. So the, the two studies that we talk about in the film, uh, one was just measuring cortisol levels in children. So cortisol is a hormone associated with stress. Uh, and what we find is that during circumcision, there is massive stress hormones, right? Which makes sense. If someone is cutting into part of your body, and you're feeling every bit of it, of course mm -hmm. you're going to be stressed, right? You're in pain. Um, and I think the only reason this claim was even something people would say is because we're dealing with children who are not capable of language yet. Right. So if someone can articulate their pain, then we acknowledge it sometimes. But children can only scream. And when you hear the screams during circumcision, they are different than any other type of scream you've heard from a child. Many of the activists I interviewed said that they became interested in this issue and ca started caring about this issue when they heard the scream of the oh child. My gosh. And it is, it's, uh, you know, children have had their lungs burst w during this procedure oh from how much gosh. they're screaming. So then the second excuse people give, well, it, maybe it's painful, but they don't remember it, right? And, <laughs> and this is an excuse that you would not use in any other context. If someone said, well, don't worry, bro, she won't remember it, you would think that that person was a rapist uh -huh. and someone needed to seriously look into what they were up to. Yeah. But when we talk about, oh, well, it's fine because they're, they're children who aren't even capable of giving. I mean, it, when you get into this, the psychology is very similar to other things that people do without consent, right? It's, it's all the same excuses. But again, there, there is research to indicate that circumcision causes a lasting change in behavior, which is a form of memory. So the study in particular was one by Anand and Hickey, and it was done in the late 1980s. And even people who are pro-circumcision will acknowledge that this study is legitimate. And what they did is they tested children who were being vaccinated. And they found that one group of children being vaccinated respond really dramatically to the pain of vaccination. So vaccination, there's a needle put in and some children feel the pain 
and have one response to it. And some children feel that pain and are really dramatic in their response to it. It is like an intense pain for them, or at least in their reaction to it. So they were trying to figure out, okay, well, why is one group of children acting so dramatic when they're feeling this pain? Um, what is the variable, you know, were they breastfed or not breastfed, were they held more? And what they found was that it was the children who were circumcised who responded much more dramatically to the wow. pain. And what the researchers attributed this to was PTSD. So people who've experienced post-traumatic stress disorder, they have a traumatic event in their life, and then they feel something later that triggers the not just that event in and of itself, but the feeling of the original pain that they felt. So what they were finding was that children who've been circumcised had an extremely painful experience during circumcision, and then they felt a pain later, and the memory of the pain of circumcision came back to them in the form of PTSD. Now, that's a form of memory, and it's a, it's a different kind of memory than what you and I might talk about when we talk about memory. So when adults talk about memory, we're talking about what you might call narrative memory. You know, what did you do you, yesterday? Uh, what did you have for breakfast? There's a story that you can tell about it. But the body also remembers, and there's a lot of research around this. There's an entire area of healing known as somatic healing that deals with just the memories of the body and preverbal memories. So this is similar to the somatic memory is similar to the memory that, say, an animal might have. You know, when you come home and your dog sees you, your dog recognizes you and is happy to see you. And if you were to beat your dog, you, your dog would flinch when he sees you, right? That's yeah. also a form of memory. Now, your dog can't tell you a story about who you are or anything like that, but it knows through repeated experiences. And if someone was to beat their dog because, oh, he's just a dog, he won't remember, you would think that person was a monster. Yet we do the same thing with children. Children also have a similar memory. So if you have a child, that child recognizes its mommy when it sees that. Um, it recognizes who's nice to it and who isn't. And that, uh, that will create changes in behavior that can last someone's entire life. So when you're at that early preverbal state, you are learning, your mind is developing, uh, connections are being formed in the brain, and everything that you do then is going to have a dramatic impact on the rest of that person's life. So the indication here is not just that babies do feel pain and that they do remember that pain, but that pain can have a dramatic impact on the rest of their lives. And, and it's going to be different for each person. So even with the type of PTSD that adults experience, one person might go to war and have a traumatic experience there and come home to a, you know, a loving family and a support system and be okay. And another person might come home from that experience and not be okay. And it's going to be different person to person. And so it's really hard to gauge the psychological impact of this. But you would have to believe that everything we know about childhood development and sexual trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder is wrong to think that this isn't having a huge impact on every man in America who's circumcised. Well, it's a bit like the idea of someone being sexually abused in their early childhood and then blocking it out. And then they go on into their sexual relationships and they manifest all of these issues. Like for women, it can often be like a oh, low libido or can't lubricate or develop these growths in their reproductive organs or have what's called like, I call it vagina on clamp down, which is a very common symptom of unresolved sexual abuse where their vaginas are literally like clamped shut and won't open because the body is saying, hey, until you heal me, I'm not open for business. Like, you know, I need healing. And, but they don't know, and, and they might start to do some work and uncover that. Some people have memories of these experiences. Maybe they were older. But if you, but for men, you know, and I, one of the major, major things that I see in men as a sexual challenge is premature ejaculation. Like the stats are something like 75% of men ejaculate within three minutes of intercourse. And to me, this is massive. Like the way men can overcome this with a lot of work, but there's this massive dissociation and disconnect with their genitalia. And they often will, you know, claim that it's sort of like they get to this place and then they 
feel like they don't have control. They lose control. There's like a blackout zone. And I attribute that. My theory is that that's a big part of that could be circumcision related. But overall, like, so you're talking about these somatic memories and deeper memories and people having the psychological and emotional imprint, energetic imprint of having had these experiences done to them. How have you seen people heal? Because I would imagine that, so apart from the physical aspect of restoring the foreskin, but you know, I would think that even men who might perceive something a little bit off, if they have that level of self-awareness, won't it'll be hard for them to attribute it to circumcision unless they're in a community having those discussions or like you had a direct personal insight, like from your intuition, that they're not really allowed to even make that connection. So I would imagine that A, first, that's a struggle to kind of put piece that together. And then B, like, what have you seen people do to heal the more energetic, emotional imprinting of those experiences from a trauma perspective? So the types of healing work that I have seen be most effective and heard from men are most effective fall into two categories. What you would call somatic work, so work that bypasses the conscious mind and goes straight to the body. And there is a whole genre of healing work that you could call somatic work. And the other category is what you might call trance-based work or work that bypasses the conscious mind to go to the deep mind, things like primal therapy or hypnosis, or I actually just this past week became certified in a method known as completion process, which uses the feeling that's arising in the present moment to go back mm -hmm. to the memory where that feeling was first felt. Right. And there's and, a lot of, so I'll just interject there, but yeah, there's a number of those therapies I recommend in my work for the, for exactly that, like sexual abuse and trauma assault type healing, because we want to get into the visceral neural pathways of the body and bypass any mental, like talking about it doesn't help, it doesn't actually heal. You can recognize, okay, intellectually, this might be where this came from. I get it. That's why I'm having these reactions, but it doesn't actually remove the reaction. Yeah. T talk therapy tends to be ineffective on this, except in one case. If the person it feels like they're not allowed to talk about mm. this issue or feel this mm -hmm. issue, then having someone else validate that that's okay can be really powerful. Because very often men do have feelings about this, and when they try to share them, they're told, you know, what's wrong with you? That's normal. Mm -hmm. um, is, what, are you saying there's something wrong with your penis? And there's all this sort of shaming that goes towards that. And so hearing someone else talk about it, I mean, I find this happens even just with my film. People ask me, oh, what do you do? It's a casual question. And then uh, I'll share some of you know the film with them. And then just me saying, oh, I made a film about this issue gives people permission to talk about it and go, oh, yeah, like mm -hmm. I've heard something that I felt something about that. Um, so that's the one case in which I think it's useful is just the validating of someone's feelings and yeah. making it okay to go there. Well, presumably that the person they're speaking to will validate them and not just say it's normal. You'd have to find a special circumcision trauma therapist to work with because I bet, you, you know, you'll be, be dealing with people's own inherent... how many therapists do that. Yeah, right. Their own inherent biases. Well, they, they treat it as, um, like that this person must have some unique psychosis or oh. issue to be concerned with that. And if you're a healer and you invalidate the person you're working with, you're not a healer. You know, that you will never accomplish healing in, until you can acknowledge the problem. And so even getting men the, the emotional and healing services they need is difficult. And something that I'm working on, uh, trying to create a site that will you know, allow those sort of healers to list themselves and yeah. connect them with the men who need right. it most. But uh, right now, it's there's not a lot. And th there really needs to be because there have been men who've committed suicide over the grief they feel over this issue. There have been a lot of men who have all sorts of different problems. And, and when you do healing work, it is it is healable. You know, I think a lot of people have the idea that because you cannot yet get back the physical tissue, although there are people working on that question as well, that you can't heal the emotional side. And that isn't true. You know, there are people who get in an accident and they wind up in a wheelchair and they still heal. You know, they might not be able to, to walk again or, or physically heal, but you can still find some 
peace and good feeling within yourself. And, and the good news is that everything we know about, you know, sexual trauma or preverbal trauma or anything related to those can be used on this. So all the things you know right. about healing those do apply here. So tell me a bit more about those modalities then that you said you've seen success with. You said somatic based therapies and trance type work. Yeah. So the thing those two have in common is that they bypass the conscious mind mm -hmm. to go straight to the feeling. Because at the time this wound was created, you didn't have the, you know, if it was done in infancy, you didn't have the mental story there. So the mental story is something that was created later to cope with the feelings. So if we just go straight to the feelings, which you can get at through the body, or you can get at through uh, the, the part of the mind that can access those feelings, then you'll get there. And, and that whole process is something we could do an entire podcast on. But I, if I was um, suggesting a modality to someone, I have found a lot of success with completion process. Um, I found a lot of success with different types of body work. And I have heard from people that they've had success with primal therapy and hypnosis, although I haven't tried either of those in that context myself. Got it. So what's the, you said, you mentioned that when you bring the film up to people, it often gives them an outlet or this feeling of permission to finally voice these feelings or even identify them. What's your overall response been to the film? So far, it's been really positive. Um, and I actually went into it thinking there might be more pushback, but I actually think the culture has mm. changed during the time I've been making the film where it's more okay to have these discussions and the places we can have those discussions have increased. So when I started working on the film, it was a very long process. And when I started, you know, the social media we have now didn't exist. So Facebook was just becoming popular. Twitter was new. Instagram did not exist yet. And the types of podcasts like yours were not popular yet. There were, you know, if you talk to someone about podcasting, they'd say, what's that? Mm -hmm. Is that like a radio show? Now, that's all that we do when we consume media. Most young people don't even have a TV in their room. They have a laptop. And so the way that people receive information is different now. And the willingness to receive new information is greater. Because I think people are starting to see that there's a lot outside the traditional corporate media that has great things that they might want to learn about or a lot to offer in those spaces. So the reception has been incredibly positive. Uh, I've seen a lot of messages on social media and gotten a lot of messages from people saying that the movie has changed their life. It changed their decision with their own children. It allowed them to feel heard. And a lot of men have said that there was a something that they wanted acknowledged in greater culture for a long time that my film acknowledged. So it's been really positive. And what I've noticed now is that the people who don't want to understand this issue or don't want change on it have largely fallen silent because before, you know, someone would go on TV or they'd write an article or write something in a newspaper talking about, oh, how great circumcision is. And no one had a way to speak back to them. And now if they say something like that, the men right. who've been harmed by this and the parents who feel like they were deceived by their doctor when the doctor pushed this on them are able to talk back to them. And when you put those two stories side by side, it's not very flattering for the people who are still promoting this. And so they've largely fallen silent. You know, in my work, I talk about how the vagina is capable of all different kinds of orgasms and sensations. And in Taoist reflexology, they apply the same concept of a reflexology map to male and female genitalia. And so there's like, say, the head of the penis is connected to the heart and the cervix in the woman is connected to the heart point and beautifully like they match up when they're inserted, you know, together. And so 
there's all of these different sensations and emotions and pleasure spots that vary throughout the anatomy. And in your film, you feature someone called Glenn Callender, and he talks about how he can have orgasms with different parts of his foreskin. And um, like, <laughs> just tell me about Glenn and his fantastic foreskin and his multi-orgasmic abilities, because he seems like he's basically demonstrating this in the male version of there's all these different pleasure spots in an intact man that are available that somebody else may not have. So I'll preface this by saying that Glenn is an outlier and that the same way that there are women who have their whole anatomy, who have a variety of different amounts of sexual pleasure based on their knowledge of their body and their comfort in their body. And if they have received shame or approval for their sexuality, the same is true of intact men. Well, so let me just interject there, though, because because in my philosophy, everyone can, but they have different kinds oh, of blocks can. Yeah, that lay on top yes. of that, that then once yes. those blocks are removed, which could take minutes and could take years, depending on the person, yes. um, they all we all have that same potential to be crazy multi-orgasmic, 30 orgasms in a row, like everyone can, but it takes work to get there and to heal often to right. get there. Okay. Great. Uh, that's where I was going next. Okay, yeah, I, I totally agree. So everyone, everyone is capable of that, but not everyone does. And I bring that up because every now and then someone will see that sequence and say, well, I know an intact guy who can't do that. And then okay, right. you ask some more questions and they go, well, he always felt insecure about his foreskin growing up because people right. told him he was different and there was something wrong with that. And it's like, oh, okay, well, maybe that has something to do with it. So right. um, what Glenn did is he looked at a study called the Sorrel study, which went into penile sensitivity. It's one of the best studies that has been done on intact anatomy. And he said, well, I have all those parts. Like, what is the difference between them? And so in his show and in his work, he will simply stimulate just one part of the penis. So he'll be touching the ridged band or the frenulum and not touching the head of the penis, not doing any type of stroking motion. And he's able to have multiple orgasms on camera. Uh, in the film, we sort of frame it in a way where you see him talking about it and you see it out of focus in the background because I knew that uh, certain platforms would not let me get away with showing that in yeah. full. But it's on the internet if you're really curious. Um, but he would just sort of touch those parts and then have multiple orgasms. So in one part, he has five orgasms from the ridge band of the foreskin in two minutes. And what he talks about in his show is that those are different sensations. So the same way that a clitoral orgasm feels different for a woman than, say, a G-spot orgasm, something from the ridge band feels different than the head of the penis. Now, I can't report that from first person because I... I'm circumcised, I don't have the ridge band, but I do know in myself that the head of the penis and the frenulum or what remains of it feel different. And so if you become aware of your body, even if you are circumcised, you may begin to notice that there are different sensations from different parts of the body. And that some of those places, if enough nerve endings remained or there's enough sensitivity there or you're aware enough of that part of your body, you might be able to orgasm from in isolation and you might be able to have multiple orgasms from. So in, in his show, he's not pausing between those orgasms. A lot of people believe that when a man orgasms or ejaculates, that that's it and that means that they have to stop or that's the amount that they can have. And at least in intact men, that's not necessarily true. So you can keep going. I mean, obviously it takes a lot of energy. Um, and there, there, there is at some point a stopping point, but it is possible to have multiple orgasms from just touching parts of the foreskin in isolation. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, to me, this is all big unmapped territory. Like I'm a specialist, I guess, in mapping out the territory of the vagina and to some degree the cock, but I'd like to dive deeper into this actually and really devote a portion of my work to that to map out more of these areas so that men understand what's really possible for them in an intact penis. You know, what their birthright really it, is for pleasure. Because we think that female pleasure is 
sorry, we think that female pleasure is so complex, right? So complex. And probably male pleasure in some ways has been reduced to being more simple because of circumcision, where in an intact man, it sounds like there's many more layers and nuances that are available to him. Yeah, I think that in popular culture, male sexuality is sort of seen like a light switch. Mm -hmm. Like you turn it on or you turn it off and, you know, it goes in and out and then feels good. And in reality, there's a lot of different sensations and the penis actually has moving parts. So the foreskin is gliding over top the head of the penis. And when a man is circumcised, it is, it's changed. It is now, um, closer to a dildo essentially, as opposed to having that gliding motion. And by the way, when, People get things like ribbed condoms or um, sex toys that have some sort of ribbing on them. That's meant to simulate the sensation of the foreskin. The foreskin mm -hmm. naturally has that. So I think that there is a lot to map here. And, and women's sexuality is ahead of men's in this regard. We, we have, you know, I think a lot of people will complain about the research that's been done on women's sexuality and how uh, up until fairly recent history, scientists were unable to prove the female orgasm, which there's a whole series of jokes you could make about that. But men sexualize even further behind. I, I, I don't know that anyone has done the research. I mean, there's the Sorrell study. There is the anecdotal things you've heard from people like Glenn in the intactivist community. There's obviously video of things like this. But in terms of really mapping it, and sharing that information to a wider audience. I don't know that that work has been done yet. Me, me, I'm going to do it. <laughs> I 100% support you doing it. Inspired a new I, direction. I look forward to hearing about hmm? your many adventures on this journey. Well, thank you. I mean, you've inspired a new direction in my work because that just kind of lit up for me in discussing this that, all right, so it is really just like, I mean, I, I like I said, because of that reflexology map, I knew that there were these different attributions to different parts of the male anatomy, but I hadn't taken it in in the same way that the, the vagina has all these different unique orgasmic sensations that we don't, we really, you know, to me, when I work with men with tantric breathing practices and Taoist exercises, they can have more expanded and full body orgasms, learn to orgasm without ejaculation. Like that's usually the direction that we go in versus all of these other, you know, ge geography that's on the penis. So yeah, inspiring stuff. I would be really interested in that reflect reflexology map because as, as I understand it, it's the idea that certain parts of the body correspond to other systems or parts of the body. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. So basically, yeah. Well, so, I was just going to say that would be interesting because then you could see what parts might be affected if the corresponding part in the genitals has been cut off. Well, I I will, I'll you send you a copy from that of one of these maps, but basically like from the head of the penis, you've got pineal pituitary glands and then heart, you know, heart would be the big area that's really, and I would say that that's one of the major issues I see in men is a cock heart disconnection, right? Like we, we have this, there's this perpetuated myth that men are much more easily able to separate out that way, but I don't believe that that's reality. Like I believe that's a conditioned thing. And, you know, if you look at this as reinforcing that, then it would say there's literally been a cut in the heart point of the cock. So do you want to hear some interesting evidence of that theory? Yes. One of the people I interviewed, uh, she didn't make the edit of the film, but she's in the bonus features, is Patricia Robinette. Patricia Robinette was a, is a woman who was circumcised in middle America. And... One of the things that people don't know is that female circumcision used to be legal and not uncommon in America as a medical practice. A so medical you practice can find for articles, what? What was the justification for that? Uh, a lot Are of the doing? similar justifications yeah. for right. male circumcision is that it's cleaner, it's better, it feels good. Um, 
there was an article from Playgirl in the 70s talking about, oh, it's so much better if you <gasps> remove that extra skin. Oh. Yeah. I mean, you can look this stuff up. Um, <sighs> Patricia Robinette wrote a book about her experiences called The Rape of Innocence. And there is another book that the name I'm blanking on, it's a very like academic tomb. If you put female circumcision into Amazon and want to get a giant piece of academic reading on this, it goes into the full history. But one of the things that Patricia talked about is that she had a lot of similar attitudes and traumas as men. So she reported that she would go from sexual experience to sexual experience, never feeling quite fulfilled, feeling like, oh, maybe if I try this new partner or this new position, I'll finally get what I'm looking for. Um, her sexuality mirrored a lot of the negative stereotypes we have about men, which brings up the question, are these things that are true of men or are these things that are true of men who have received sexual trauma on the first day of their life? Right. And if that's the case, it implies that a lot of our research around gender or sexuality is untrue because it doesn't control for circumcision status. Yeah. So if all the knowledge we had of women came from studies of circumcised women, right. I it, you'd, you'd question those studies and say, well, is that really true? Or you've got this huge variable you're not accounting for. Exactly. Um, and so, I, you know, one of the things that Patricia talks about is like all of the things that you would say about men and male sexuality were true of her until she processed her trauma and she actually ended up becoming a hypnotherapist and doing a lot of healing work and things like that. So it's very similar when you look at the trauma for both genders. And I, I suspect that lo a lot of the ideas we have about men and male sexuality are really ideas about traumatized people. It's a brilliant observation. Yeah. So is there anything else you want to add? to the mix before we wrap up. We think we've covered a lot. We've covered why not and how you can heal. Is there anything else you want to add? One thing comes to mind. So I think it is important to do the healing work here, not just on yourself, but on the greater culture. Because if you, you know, one of the things that Martin Luther King said is that he treated society as his patient and him as a therapist and only a society that is sick in some way or mentally ill in some way could treat people this way hmm. and when you look at it through that frame then activism can become a kind of healing work something that you do to help shift and heal everyone and i think when we raise consciousness around this issue enough there will be new types of healing that are available so, for example, one of the things that people are working on is the idea of regenerative medicine, using things like stem cells or mm -hmm. gene editing right. to regrow parts of the body. Yeah. So there, there have been cases where someone had a finger cut off and they regrew it with stem cells. There was a case in Hong Kong where a woman's entire vagina was recreated using stem cells. What? And I believe... I believe that it would be possible to do the same for the foreskin. Now, it would require a lot of money and it would require someone with the technical knowledge and willingness to do it and someone with the ability to fund it and someone who's willing to be the test subject or uh, brave enough to be one of the first people to try this. But it, I, I want to put that out there because if there's someone in your audience in that field or has a connection to a connection, that's something that I think a lot of people are looking for. But the demand for that will help create the possibility of it. So, you know, a, a product that would make men's dicks bigger and their orgasms better, I'm 100% certain there's a market for that. Oh but most people don't have the consciousness to be even aware of the problem to yes. think about that application. Amazing. So, so that, anyone... That's something... Anyone out there in Silicon Valley who wants to experiment with um, obtaining a larger, more pleasurable, multi-orgasmic cock, please get in touch. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad um, you said I'll that. I'll also add, I'm putting together a site to make all these things easier. It's still in development, but hopefully I'll be able to share that with you in a month or two. And people who want to find a healer can find one. People who want to find a local activist group can find one. 
and all the other things. Even things like, you know, if you're having a child and you want to find a doctor or doula who is in tech friendly, who doesn't practice this, we're going to try to connect those people too. Excellent. So definitely let me know once you have that up and running, because those are resources I would want to share for sure. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Brendan. Thank you so much for taking up the charge and doing all of this research and putting all of this information out there to really educate people and help them to understand and break through what we've been told collectively. So your work is very, very much appreciated. Thank you. I appreciate you being willing to hear it. So thank you for being on the show and we will put information about the film. And then, as I say, in the future, when this other information becomes available, we will put that out as well to my audience. Thank you.